all of them things can happen, but don't happen to to everybody. You know, it depends on the type of dementia is going to be. Yeah. Balance does become an issue. And for myself with Alzheimer's, balance sort of at times is an issue and other times absolutely no issue at all. Yeah. Uh, I think it depends how tired I sort of am as well, you know, mm -hmm. as to whether it affects me. Definitely speech is a thing. Um, you know, quite often I would describe it as I can hear the word, but I can't actually find it to, to say it. Um, you know, so it's the frustration element of that mm. that sort of comes along. Uh, this is pre-diagnosis he's talking about, is it here? Yeah. Well, so he's he's just interested in how, in anything you have to offer, because obviously over the course of the opera, okay, from he's kind of going to, yeah, yeah, he's going to develop. It's, and it may be hard to portray that at different times things will affect you more than others, you know, but I think if there was a way to bring that out, that would be good, you know, that mm -hmm. there's times speech is perfectly okay. Yeah. And there's other times you really sort of struggle. I. I think if, he, if there's any point in the opera that he's portraying being particularly tired or, um, you know, feeling low within himself, then all these things are much worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, when you said about when you can hear the word or you, you've got the word in your head, but you can't get it out, yes. and it makes you frustrated. So then if and when it does come out, because you're frustrated, does it sound more, I, I don't know, like harsher than you intended? It would do. Or? It would, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And quite often, you know, family, you know, sort of thing, are you really cross and you're not really cross? Okay. You know, mm. but it's just the this damn thing really you know that at times it sort of affects you more than than others you know so if there's a way of portraying that but as I say for myself it would be the disorientation side of things you know not mm -hmm. sometimes quite knowing the fake and look in your eye you know my husband he can always tell if I'm having a bad day <laughs> Because he says, I just have that look that he knows I'm not processing things the way I, I, I sometimes can. As I say, balance can be a bit of an issue, but I would know a lot, a high percentage of people who have dementia who would not need to use a walking stick. And I use a walking stick now, but because of my bad knee, not because of my dementia. Okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's interesting, isn't it? Because obviously, as we all know, that it's it's never just dementia you know other things are going on even yes, if you have other health conditions you know some yeah. people have heart conditions some people diabetic some people um you know have arthritis like myself other people will have other issues that yeah. are sort of underlying um and it could know, be those that we're seeing yes rather yeah. than the dementia yeah i yeah. think so i think so First of all, I would say when I was first diagnosed, um, Rosemary, who was with me, was talking to the neurologist about him appearing as though he was not with me. That's the best way, not with me, you know, not in the moment, mm -hmm. not present in the moment. And we likened it almost to like a petty mal type condition, you know, that. Um, you weren't wasn't having a seizure or wasn't mm -hmm. having any kind of outward symptoms but simply withdrawn so so that is really one of the best physical symptoms if you like mm. because it's about change yeah and if within the opera they can de if they can show a change in this gentleman that would be really powerful yeah. from him not displaying that sort of behavior to displaying it um anxiety often is shown through physical symptoms as well. Mm -hmm. And one thing I tend to do, if I'm doing this artistically, by way of any kind of picture or whatever, illustration, I'll often use hands, the image of hands. And sometimes when I've been filmed for television, 
the camera has focused upon my hands. So it's moved away from my face and the cameraman has identified the fact that my hands are doing some of the talking for me. And they're, they're, right. they are away, almost like your eyes, they're away mm -hmm. into the person. Mm -hmm. And so if again, if he can sort of show, not by way of a, a Parkinsonian type shake, it's not that necessarily, it's that the hands become much more expressive and much more other people become aware of the person's hands not being as still or as controlled as mm -hmm. as they would normally be but it's not a shake mm -hmm. and would you say that if you're like can people around you sort of detect that you're more anxious because, yes. because your hands, your hands. Are... Oh. yeah 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 because i use the the, the metaphor a lot Kathy, about having a mask and and you know i do wear a mask a lot because it screens what i'm uh, living with from other people yeah. uh, and there's a re variety of reasons i do that but the hands are more difficult to screen than the face mum was always very ass I mean, pretty assured but one thing i noticed that increased as her dementia went on was when she was asked a question she would often look at me as she was answering just to gauge what I was saying or, or what, what my face was doing. So she was answering something. So particularly the GP, mm -hmm. she asked her if she was having so-and-so. Whereas without the dementia, she would have never thought of, well, it's me. And he's asking about me. But more and more, and as she got, got worse, she would, if he asked, I don't know, are you in, uh, have you had much pain with your hip? Or are you very mobile? Something she should be able to answer, but she would be looking at me, is what I'm saying correct is Jane's face and we had that sort of okay where I, I kind of like raised my eyebrows and then she could say but maybe Jane knows better or and it was up to her to to, to let me speak but so it's just mm -hmm. that I don't know if he's noticed it's that, that reassurance was, isn't it it's that seeking yeah. out reassurance really yeah. um, it's what I'm saying right and that was increasing as she got worse yeah yeah, don't speak for me, but is what I'm saying right is a good way of yeah. putting it. Another thing that Jane has just prompted in my mind, Kathy, that yeah. wasn't there before, was that, and this Rosemary will often tell people this, one complete change in me is that if she's not in the room when I'm there, I get very anxious and wonder where she is. Again, yeah. that's a physical symptom. So that might be something that the actor mm. or the, the singer could could display to the audience this idea that they're, 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 they're needing a the reassurance that Jane's quite rightly just described but also the reassurance of the person being in their physical space mm -hmm. because if they're not in their physical space the person with dementia gets gets, yeah. gets anxious and worried oh. we were talking about that just yesterday with mum I was, I was talking to someone about dementia um and about the fact that mum you know didn't always know who I was the labels daughter Jane yeah. But I was reassured, and this was the thing I was saying to someone, I was reassured by the fact that she still cared about me, knew I cared about her, was because we used to run the group, or I used to run the, help run the group. So when we were at a group, she might be doing something, and she's quite happy doing it, and I'm off maybe sorting out something mm -hmm. away from her, maybe the, even the other side of the hall. But then after a while, she'd suddenly kind of like almost freeze in what she was doing, and then start looking around of, oh, where am I? Why am I here? What am I doing? And and the kind of who am I with and where how am I going to get home? Kind of. And yeah. then she'd start looking like oh, bird. She'd look around, and then when she honed in on me, even though I knew that that morning she hadn't known Jane, you just see the whole kind of like oh, it's okay, she's there. And I just smart in a wave. And if she yeah. still looked a bit nervous, I'd go over and, and maybe give her a hug and just say, "Are you all right?" You know. And just but often it was just that look of uh, yeah, a bit anxious like. And then when she honed in on me, you'd see the shoulders go down and the face relax and, and I, yeah. I'd maybe do a thumbs up and she'd do a thumbs up. And it was just, yeah. And again, that, that increases, I think, as people get yeah. more. Yeah. But, and then generally, I think with mum, something I noticed was like in the house, um, things would get moved around quite a lot. So both for herself, not knowing where things were, but also I, I come in from work and, you know, the cups were in a completely different place. So I'd open the, door, the, the cupboard door to look for coffee cups and it's like <laughs> okay where's the coffee cup so we we spent more time looking for yeah you know where the things that normally would be in that cupboard are 
Mm-hmm. But that was both of us. <laughs> yes. She'd have moved it while I was away. Yeah. So, and then she'd tell me it was my fault. <laughs> it really is trying to show the audience that this bloke, this character, is going through something that is changing his life. Yeah. Um, at a point where he wouldn't really expect it to be changed in the way it is. Just briefly going back to what you were both saying about um, sort of looking for reassurance from the family member, especially when asked a question by the doctor. I'm wondering, is that to do with sort of confidence? So being given the confidence to be reassured, yes, what I'm saying is correct, or is it more about sort of factual, you know, using some somebody else to try and verify your memory? Have I got so that correct? It's both, Cathy. Okay. And one leads into the other, really. The two are, are very connected. Yeah. You know, the flaws in one's memory um, mean that you lose the confidence in what you've said. And then, I mean, this isn't relevant to this character, but as the disease gets worse and progresses you then into things like confabulations and stuff stuff you know whereby the person believes it to be true and yes. in their mind it is true but actually objectively or factually it isn't true or it isn't mm-hmm. accurate mm-hmm. Um, but that's possibly not necessarily the the um the, the, the scenario for this story but there might be little tweaks and elements of that you know the starting point yeah. for that the doubts the doubts that creep in you yeah. know, whereby the person, I mean, we all do this, whether we've got dementia or not. We all try and make sense of what we're experiencing and what, we, what we're going through. And, and we try and do that as fairly and as truthfully as we possibly can. Yeah. But no matter whether you've got dementia or not, there are going to be gaps in that understanding. Yeah. And sometimes the gaps in that understanding are where, where the grey areas emerge and where potential frustrations and conflicts can arise because yeah. your view might be different to my view um and, and you know dementia just makes that worse it yeah. doesn't really create that because mm-hmm. i think that's part of the human psyche anyway um you know that we all try and make sense of what we're experiencing uh, with the information that's available to us and our own cognitive abilities definitely and beliefs yeah prejudices and all the rest of it that goes with that you know yeah with flaws and our inadequacies we, we we try and make sense of 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 situations and scenarios to enable us to um to, to function really yeah yeah i think it's also if, you, if you're part of a pair as a couple um you've got different interests and the things you remember more clearly are the things you're interested in yeah, that's so true. for example, you know, classic old one, you know, that that song I wore, I can't remember what it was, where it's a couple talking, oh. singing, you know, and I, yes. I wore white um, and blue, and it's, I can't remember what it was. You, 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 I can see it, yes, in your head, but there's one where um, there's sort of argument about, but it's around things like a woman's probably more likely to remember the, the color of the dress she wore at that particular occasion, yeah. Yeah. And there isn't isn't the line the ref, the phrase that keeps getting repeated? Oh yes, I remember it well. And it's ironic because they've ba- basically they've got, just yeah. proved that they have yeah. completely yeah, that's different the old song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's yeah. the one. And and so classically, in a, any couple or any pairing of friends, we're going to remember different things because the things that are important yeah. to us yeah. are what we remember better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I I would have no idea how well the rugby score was in you know this is back in the eighties you know, last year, where's my husband remember? Yeah. yeah. Got no recollection of, I don't know, what dress I wore to the wedding or, yeah. you know, what we bought his nephew for a birthday present or all those things because they just didn't yeah. interest him. And it was my yeah. job. And it's those sort of things. So those are natural within a, a pairing. Yeah. I think what happens is, and it, again, with mum and I, we had different interests, so different things we remember differently. <laughs> but it was the, the, she was aware that there was more things that she was going to get wrong. And so if it was important, I mean, she knew that if it was something that wasn't important, she'd just blag it. Yeah. But, <laughs> but then in, 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 to, to, to take what Jane said then into the context of the opera, again, it comes back to this business about changes. Because yeah. if, if the person was really interested in rugby before 
and had a good recall of yeah. rugby scores and rugby names and players and all the rest of it. But then that becomes more difficult for them. Yeah. That's when it really shows up. Yeah. Yes, yeah. What, and, what and... one was wearing a week ago or even yesterday, that might not really have registered before the onset of dementia anyway. Yeah. So I think that's, that's, that's the point really to try and capture if one can. It yeah. Is those changes really, is, yeah. is the best best summing up really for for what we're talking about today and so given that as we've said sort of naturally people have different interests and things that appeal to them to their memory from a particular situation and then if dementia is added into the mix then that becomes harder anyway so yeah. does it mean that the things that you can still both remember and share do they become more precious because there's all of these ways in which you might not share the same thing they do mm. they do they do um they do become more precious and and they become more entrenched as well because okay. of that you know um and and that's sometimes why people will say a care family carer will say and, and david has said this a number of times um you know you've got to make out you've not heard it before yeah. yes yeah you know, that's the yeah. thing because that that memory has become so entrenched in that person's mind it is still fresh yeah yeah um yeah that's probably the best way of, yeah. from, to try and describe it with with us it's, i mean two things there when, when you're talking about interest so two of the things that mum and i always shared was a love of certain books we're both really keen readers and we had it was a sort of, if you know, a Venn diagram of the books that we enjoyed. <laughs> so she didn't enjoy my science fiction or things like Hitchhiker's Guide, but the, some of the sort of detective novels and those sort of Agatha, Agatha, Agatha Christie, those sort of things. Mm -hmm. And some of the more romantic novels as well. And there's there's a one of our favourites was, a, I think, called Pilot's Wife from Anita Shreve. And I remember talking to her about this beautiful, really nice little modern, um, novel. Quite a, a sort of, you know, intricate kind of... Um, storyline and like the detective ones oh I'd have spotted it then those <laughs> so we have those discussions of oh in that that chapter that's when you know it's her you know it's it's those okay things. yeah and we like the you know the same with the detective stories but and I remember the first time when mum wasn't being able to read a whole story and retain it so we could talk mm -hmm. that way and I finished a book that I knew she'd like and my brain said I'll take that to mum mum would like that and then that realization of, but she won't be able to share it with me in the way we used to, because she couldn't retain. So I was finding lots of books that had a chapter about this, a chapter about that. There's one, Nella Last Diary, um, really good little books. There's lots of little stories about someone living in the war. But we could talk about gardening because she'd retained that for a long time. Yeah. So that became our, our main concentrated mm -hmm. sharing of going looking at gardens, going to garden centres doing gardening at the house yeah the books had gone definitely you can become the dementia rather than being you now, I, I'm probably not the best one to sort of answer because I was extremely lucky. I, I would know a lot of friends who have dementia, who lost a lot of friends. Mm. I yeah. didn't. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if that's because I was very sort of open about it and sort of initially sort of told people what I wanted or needed. You know, so they didn't have to try and work out if they were yeah. going to do the wrong thing. You know, and I always would have said to people, you know, ask me what I need or want, don't presume. And I would be very quick in telling people if they did presume, you know, that yeah. like I, I really want to try and do this myself or I might need a bit of support, but alas. Uh, but yes, you definitely... <laughs> I think in... <laughs> In more, in other circles, not sort of with friends, if you tell somebody mm -hmm. you have dementia, then their attitude can instantly change and they start to talk to whoever's with you. 
Wow. You know, if you say to somebody, you know, just say in a bank or a shop, you say, look, I'm sorry, I just need a wee bit of time. I've got dementia. You know, if uh, Tom's with me, they'll automatically talk to him. Even though you've you've basically said, I just need a bit of time. So sort yeah, of, yeah, you, yeah. you've made it okay. You've taken any worry out of it. Yeah, yeah. You know, just give me a bit of time here. Or, you know, can you explain that? I'm sorry, I'm not quite getting that. And again, if I was in a situation that I wasn't sort of understanding something, I would look mm -hmm. and I would say, look, can you explain that again? And I would look to my husband and then he would sort of maybe try and explain it in a way that I would sort of get it, you know, if I was having a bit sort of more mumbled. Um, but quite often, if you say in that sort of scenario, people will talk to whoever's with you. Mm. rather than talk to you so yes I think you can be very much labelled but I think that's the same with any illness or any disability you know if somebody's in a wheelchair like my daughter you know they'll talk to you know does she want sugar in her tea we'll ask her <laughs> <laughs> she I, think, I think you could get the answer yeah and she doesn't have a power in one of her arms but like she can tell you if she wants sugar in her tea yeah um but I think that's commonplace. I, I don't know if it's because people feel awkward or embarrassed or frightened of saying or doing the wrong thing. So it's easier to, in a way, cut you out and go to somebody who they deem as being totally normal. Mm. Yeah. And yet they don't know what issues my husband has. Yeah. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? You, you can't know, necessarily them, see. But they don't know that he's had a heart attack, you know, they don't know, yeah. you know, what other is diabetic, you know, so they don't know a lot of things about him. But mm -hmm. I have openly sort of said, like, I have dementia and I have a card, you know, mm -hmm. I said, look, can you just give me a wee bit of time? But I say quite often they would sort of relate to the person who you're with. Wow. Now, I would be quite strong, you know, in myself that I would sort of pull them back to me. But a lot of people would sort of become, I don't want to use the word mousy, but would sort of accept it and sort of maybe be annoyed and bubbling sort of inside. I, I don't know if it's a dementia, but I can't hold that anymore. You know, I would sort of say, no, you need to speak to me. Yeah. And then they yeah. get all flustered and then they sort of <laughs> come back. You know, say you wouldn't have had to become flustered if you hadn't cut me out, you know, and I would say at that stage, like if I really don't understand if I'm struggling, I'll ask you yeah. to speak to the person yeah. I'm with, but communicate with me. Uh, but oh. some people sort of will hold it and then come away, see them. Yeah. And then the person they're with will get it because <laughs> it's not really their fault. <laughs> well, that's the thing, isn't it? Because these these emotions they have to be dealt with sometime yes, somehow exactly yeah so it has to come out but like yeah. how is it going to come out and to whom is that going to be directed exactly and it's usually whoever cares for you the most really yeah. and i think what what i would answer to that is there's two ways of answering that kathy mm -hmm. and and both of them were what i've experienced i was a very public figure you know, when I was diagnosed and yeah. well known in Canterbury, it was in the paper, it was on the television, it was it was big local news yeah. that this 54 year old head teacher and Canterbury schools advisor had all of a sudden got Alzheimer's. Yeah. You know, so it was a shock to a lot of people. So consequently, the first reaction in answer to that question was shock sorrow sympathy mm. okay so again Kaifa's character might encounter some of that so you know people he knows friends he knows family members possibly if if the character is a public figure professional contacts professional um people he's, he's, he's working with will have that sense of shock sorrow and yeah. sympathy OK, so yeah. people expect that you're the living dead from day one. Yeah. 
they they you think you're at the end stages when yeah. you've got that diagnosis because that's still no matter what jane and fabulous other people do is still a widely held belief in the public yeah and we continue to crack that knot and we will do <laughs> probably forever because there's still that 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 general picture and all the time you've got wonderful films that i didn't particularly like like the father uh portraying that late stage yeah you're gonna so so that, that's that's the key thing really and then beyond that once once you then become assimilated into a new community with a, a dementia and and people then become aware down the track you've got dementia you then encounter the opposite side of that coin and you encounter disbelief mm. so you encounter the, the whether you're 80 or whether you're 50 people will will not easily accept the fact you have dementia because you don't conform to the stereotypical image of someone in a care home in the late stages yeah so in a nutshell that i think is what the character's got we've got to see where the, where the character in the story fits and where his interactions with other characters fits mm -hmm. to enable that to work for the audience yeah in conversation, um, I think I was working mostly in a community of people who, who understood. Mm -hmm. Although that's a growth process. I mean, if somebody who they knew seemed to be one of them and became one of the others, that is, that is to say a person with some sort of dementia, they've grown with it gradually. So that works quite well in a community, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I didn't. We didn't travel around a lot into strange environments once uh, my wife had dementia. I mean, mother mother in law, uh, who lived with us, um, again she because she came into our community from outside, she was accepted uh, as um, you know as a person who had those problems, um, and this is it's a, essentially it's a church community. Yeah, but I, I mean, I'm familiar with the whole idea, and I've heard people and seen it happening in cafes, and how uh, insensitive people, driven by the idea that they have to have what they want, will treat people very badly. I mean, you know, and and, and no no quarter given, e even if it becomes clear that that person, you know, has difficulties. Yeah, I was at a DAA meeting, a national DAA meeting in London. And um, I was in a round group of people at lunchtime talking just socially and networking. And amongst that group was a guy from Department of Health, as it was then. Mm -hmm. And um, he was asking who various people were in this clique of five or six people I was part of at that moment in time. And he got to me and I uh, said, you know, my name's Keith Oliver. I'm a, I'm a person who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease 18 months ago. And he immediately blanked me. <gasps> immediately blanked me and 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 then i wasn't part of that conversation anymore and it wasn't because they were any more important than me in that group mm. it really was he didn't know how to talk to someone with dementia but isn't it it's so it's such a it's not a logical reaction i think that's I what always really shocks me because like you say you know he was perfectly fine to go and and who are you and yeah, what's your yeah. name and your role yeah. and it was only when you said the yeah. magic word yeah. that suddenly he decided whole oh. the whole attitude changed i, I do the memory days at, at the ejs bowl so hampshire cricket and we had a whole load of, so they come along, they can watch free and we're up in the stand and it's beautiful. And we, we had um, one of the executives from Hampshire Cricket came up to talk to them. And I'd never heard the word debenture, which apparently is people that give money kind of, um, so it was when, when we moved or Hampshire Cricket moved from within Southampton out to the outskirts where it is now. And lots of people gave money to the cricket club to help them make that move. And apparently debenture. Um, I must look it up properly and then I've got a better explanation. But so these were sort of like patrons. So they okay. came in and when they'd said, come up and meet the guys, the, the, they'd said dementia guys, but he read, heard debenture guys. So he came in and he spent about 45 minutes chatting away to all our guys, having, you know, really being lovely with them. Because I, I, when he had turned up, I hadn't, I wasn't actually there. So I couldn't, 
So I said, we would, we, asked, we would have asked you to give a briefing, but we thought, well, we've been chatting to them, so they're fine, you know. Yeah. And as we're going out, they, they said, oh, and James Bax will introduce, um, introduce me. And that's when the word dementia came up. And this guy went, oh, my gosh, I didn't know they had dementia. Oh, 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 I'm, 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 how, how should I have spoken to them? And I said, well, you, you were fine. And, and, uh, but he was really shaken that he'd been talking to these. And I, I was so glad wow. that he didn't know that they had dementia before we talked to them. Because exactly as Keith said, what difference would it have made? He just went and talked to people. Mm -hmm. He didn't talk to people with dementia. He talked to people. And that was the difference. He's not been yeah. back. We've been doing it for about, that was probably about year two. We've been going for, this year will be about seven. You've got members who we know have got dementia, who you talk to in the members enclosure. But because they haven't got a D on their, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. on their forehead, you don't know. I guess I was just going to ask, has that ever happened in like um, a medical context? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, that's where it would happen probably the most. OK. You know, you would win. Normally when you go to appointments, as in, you know, to see the consultant who made the diagnosis, when you go for a review, you know, they will bring yeah. you into the room, then bring your husband into the room, then you both are in the room. So... In that situation, it doesn't really happen so much because you've already had the chance on your own. Yes, yeah. To sort of, and then I think it is important that whoever you live with or is with you the most sort of has a chance because things I I will miss stuff mm -hmm. that you know, and I don't know if the consultant maybe asks slightly different questions to the person who cares for you, you know, to try and get a, you know, a different sort of angle. I, I don't know, mm -hmm. but as I say, and then you have, you know, we're both of you sort yeah. of in the room. So in that situation, it wouldn't happen so much. But if I went generally to a doctor's and my husband came with me, mm -hmm. quite often they would ask my husband about the condition. And again, I would sort of say, I'm the one that can tell you more about this than he can, you know, it's, yeah. Um, yeah, it can be quite frustrating, you know, that you sort of think, you know, you know, I had even gone to the dentist and we both had checkup appointments at the one time and the dentist knows I have dementia because I sort of told him on the medication that I'm on. Yeah. And the dentist has said, you know, do you both want to come into the room for a long time? It's only a checkup. I was so sorry I did because they were asking him but I had any problems with my teeth. <laughs> Can you see, you know what tooth I have problem with? It's my mouth. <laughs> I mean, that would be impressive sort of mind reading knowledge to go, oh, it's the molar, oh, it's you know, one, three yeah. back. Uh, wow. You know, and, uh, but again, I think my husband is so well first. Now he sort of knows better than to answer my behalf. <laughs> you know, he would sort of say, you know, you'd be better really asking Alice than that. Yeah. And say if I genuinely can't remember something, then I will ask yeah. my husband to sort of fill that bit in, you know. It, but as I say, try at least initially to yeah. communicate with me. Quite horrific in a way, but very powerful. I was involved with um, doing some training in care homes where we go in with the trainers and they do all the sort of, you know, the wordy bit about what is dementia or theory. Yeah. And there was yes. a team, most of us, most of the time it was four of us, carers, ex-carers. So we talk about what is dementia and then we talk about what's the experience for a carer. So these were the staff from the local Hampshire County Council care homes. Mm -hmm. So as we were getting ready to do this, we did some training. And I said, well, I, I'd love to come for this day's training, but I can't. It's not a day centre day, but even if it was, you know, the time is work. But can I bring mum? And this lady wasn't very happy about me bringing mum. But Sarah, who was the going to be doing training with me, said, that's fine. It's only the four of you. This lady, myself, why can't your mum come? So she came along, she had a book, she sat in the corner, she read a book a bit, had a bit of a doze. We managed to find her a cushion. And then when lunch came along, oh, sandwiches, do I get one? Of course you do, mum. And then as we were packing up lunch, of course, it's that bit where people are going backwards and forwards to toilets. 
and there's a lovely tray of fruit there with some grapes. And I'm stood, mum, between me, myself and this lady, mum's in a wheelchair, so she is a bit lower, but she's got the double whammy. She's known as to have dementia and she's in a wheelchair. So this lady looked and she said, oh, over mum's head, there's some lovely grapes there. Would your mum like one? So I'm looking at this lady. I looked down at mum. Mum looked up at this lady, looked over at me and said, could you tell her I'm fine, but thank you very much. That was very kind. To which I went, um, this lady, colour came down from her face and she went like a whipper out of us yeah. when she realised what she'd done. So we had to send Sarah in to go and calm her down and get her out of the toilet and say, it's okay. Yeah. And actually, why don't we put that in the training? Which we did. Yeah. But it's just, and this is a lady that's doing a training session about dementia. So that's a really classic of, of it can happen. Like before my diagnosis of dementia, I worked as a sign language interpreter and a lot of my appointments were medical with a deaf sure. person. And the doctor nine times out of 10 would have tried to ask me and I would have said, no, you need to look at whoever, I'm only their voice. Yeah. You know, they, you know, like, does she have problems sort of get up? You know, you need to ask. Yeah. She, so it's, it's similar yeah it's as interesting if, you know they can't communicate with me you know and they have to go through you know where I would have always sort of directed them back to the and so I would have really predominantly sat beside the doctor so that the doctor had to look towards the deaf person who was opposite both of us um okay. where if I sat side by side to them they would have always looked you know to myself and it's it's very similar. To, I, I don't know why in the medical profession they think it's better to ask somebody else about a condition that you have mm. unless you genuinely can't answer it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is a completely different scenario. Yeah. But that's fascinating because, yeah, I've never thought of it as similar to, like, having a translator there. Yeah. But, yeah, now you say it. Huh. Gosh, Yeah. <laughs> I think within the, within the interactions on the opera, the, the 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 cast could portray it in in a couple of ways. One is is the um, the family member talking over the person with dementia. The other is friends, neighbours, the community members talking over the person with dementia. But probably the one of the worst is the professionals who should know better talking yeah. over them. Like this case. If yeah. there's a yeah, uh, the, the, this, this 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 example Jane chose, and also people like GPs or or doctors, generally at times do that. Um, so you know, I'm sure that there's opportunities there for within the opera to to explore yeah. maybe a number of those interactions. But it does happen. It do, yeah. it happens a lot to a lot of people. Yeah, I, I don't know how Keith experienced it, but GPs would prefer to talk to me about what was going on with Mum yeah they'd ask me the question she sat there she was actually known to put her hand up a couple of times can i say something yeah. again typical my mother yeah it was actually a consultant that said that to me it was okay my gp it was on the day of diagnosis uh, but just a funny story, there's one of the members of Dementia and I, and the consultant said exactly the same to her, you know, go and put your affairs in order. <laughs> I've never had an affair. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> and I thought that was the best answer ever. I wish I had a known that before it was said to me. But yes, things were changed sort of after that. Mm -hmm. um because that was said to us both you know that was said to my husband and to okay. myself uh you know so we did have a will made so that was sort of fine uh but we did then go and get empowering empowering oh uh, enduring power of power, and that's, the, that's the word <laughs> uh so we did go and get that sorted out mm -hmm. um and as i say that has made a 
a big difference. And we've even upped that to the next level. There's something about that. Oh. Uh, and my daughter and my son had to also sign something from the solicitor so that if they felt my husband was taking advantage of some oh yes yeah, that yeah they could they had the power to sort of step it was something that was recommended but it sort of went up the next level that i didn't have any control sort of of money but in order to be able to for that to be put into place they had to agree that my husband would act on my best interest and i have right absolutely no doubt of that you know so for me it was a very very easy thing to do because I was sort of going to the hole in the wall and lift money out you know so a block had to be put in the card that I can no longer go to the ATM and lift out I still have a card that I can sort of pay for things but it's set at a lower limit okay yeah um you know so stuff to get stuff like that sort of set up with the bank you had to have this next level so yes whenever they had said that we sort of had looked into what needed to be done you know the dvl a were yeah. contacted um yeah yeah but again that was my husband that sort of researched into what it meant get your affairs in order oh th- gosh they just yeah. <laughs> say that yeah you know, wow. and he sort of thought, well, what is it? And, he, and it was actually in, um, the Dimension Navigator when she came out to see me. She was able to tell all the things, you know, like, yeah. um, you know, a plan for Pip um, about a tent and, you know, cars a lot, you know, so yeah, the like of that was sort of put into place, yes. So um, I think it is good to be told that your stuff you need to sort but I think mm-hmm. it's just very blunt, right? This is your diagnosis, so go and put your fur. It's if you're going to die tomorrow. Yeah. You know, I, as I say, whenever I got the diagnosis, I went into a really dark place. And I think most people sort of do, because yeah. when you hear the words, even though you've already worked it out, you know, whenever they actually say, it's the same if you're waiting on somebody to die, you know, when yeah. they die, it's still a yeah. huge blow. Uh, but as I say, when you hear the words, go and put your first in order, you're going to think, flip, you know, and you know you've been diagnosed with a terminal condition, you know it's a condition that can is going to deteriorate, and you know all that, but put your first in order, as if this is going to happen next week or the week after. Yeah. You know, whereas, I don't know if there's, you know, even if you were given information and saying, like, here are some things that it may be helpful for the future, that you have, you know, that you set up, uh, you know, why you still have the capacity to sort of make decisions and do things and yeah. whatever. And it'd be something maybe having a word with a solicitor about it and say, you know, I think there would be a nicer way of saying put your affairs in order. Yeah. Well, because the, the way that it's said just as that, it doesn't sound like it's helping you. It no, just sounds no. like, you know, can you make it administratively simple for everybody, please? Exactly. And before you pop your cogs in a couple of weeks, or before you get to the stage in a few weeks that you're no longer going to be able to make decisions, yeah. you know, like to me, that was sort of like a debt. I know I've been handed this sentence, I know that, but at the same time, you sort of thought, like you've sent me out of here with absolutely no hope at all. Um no contact with anybody I can make, you know, to get peer support or how important peer support is. And that's where my life, my goals, I cannot. <laughs> I just really hope that is taken very seriously on yeah. board, that people do hand that out. The, the, the thing about the GP, put your affairs in order. Yeah. One hears that so often. You know, it, that, that, that is a common approach, I'm afraid. And that's very sad and very frustrating. And, and awful to hear but by the same rule i don't want operas plays anything else to be gp bashing uh, no you know so so one needs to do that a little bit sensitively and try and as i think i said at the zoom get inside the head of the gp yeah you know, if i'm playing a g if i was in a play and i'm playing a gp i'd want to think what is motivating me to take on this these these lines in this play why am I saying these lines or why am I singing this piece 
in the opera and and therefore that then gives it more meaning and more more um um not accuracy necessarily but makes it more meaningful yeah i think that's the important point the gp probably thinks there's nothing for kaifer you know i can't offer him anything yeah so why 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 give him a diagnosis other than to say well get your house in order you know sort yeah. out power of attorney sort out wills sort out your professional position because you're going to need to probably think about early retirement or something mm -hmm. or or talk to your employer about you know um assisted working to enable you to carry on working yeah so the sort of conversations that gp would have normally the way they have those conversations and that goes back to the play where they did that brilliantly where they had the two scenarios the very yeah. abrupt, the very curt the very offhand gp and then the same actress played it much more sensitively yeah so it just depends how they're going to portray that in the opera really you see it depends what is in that gp's armory to to provide that patient with you know yeah do, do they have the information at hand to signpost them to things sort of sort of things that jane offers in in hampshire and things that are offered in kent or things that are offered in in mid wales so how how good is the knowledge yeah. of the gp yeah. to signpost people because within that um within that um, medical chest there isn't a lot really other no. than the few medications that help a few people yeah. so yeah. you know and the gp will write the prescriptions for those and and hope that they do some good I think from the work I've done with GPs and other people around here, one of the problems of GP, because I'm always saying to them, you know, we've got the, the oh, and I've got it here somewhere, yep, yeah, the Hampshire Guide, which we produce. It's got yeah. all the groups, it's got contacts. Um, so contacts, you can get in touch with the people that run the groups to see what there is. You've got the dementia advice service, whatever. We're trying to get those into GP surgeries because when they get, oh, and again, I've got, yeah, I'm not there, but, you know, you can get all these different le leaflets. And someone said the other, just yesterday, it's death by leaflet. Yeah. You've got yeah. all these leaflets and they might not be appropriate at the beginning. And this is what a GP said to me. Yeah. We have all the leaflets, we give them to someone. If they're not ready for them for a year or two years, particularly since they might, with vascular, give a, a diagnosis, put them on, like mum with mum, aspirin, and they don't keep seeing them about it. It's other things yeah. you see or you don't see someone about. So by the time two years down the line or three years down the line, you are ready to think, oh, social group. Yeah. The leaflet's out of date. So doctors yeah. don't like, like having them because they said, we'll just end up with a drawer full of out of date leaflets. Yeah. So I think it's about confidence of giving. And so if you've got a medicine, they, they know what they're talking about and yeah. they can make give you a prescription. Yeah. And that's that they've got confidence in that because it comes from, you know, research and it's yeah it's, it's been it's so tested yeah and that's what their life's about is about almost yeah. certainties and knowing that yeah. you've got this this is what the latest thing i can give you these are the side effects these are the reasons i might not give it to you you know they, they understand that dementia yeah. if they can't give a tablet it's a bit woolly they don't really understand most of them only had a couple of days if that mm. of their full time yeah so it's something that you really don't understand very well. The confidence is very low. And when you look at the confidence they have with so many other things now in their lives, you know, cancer, yeah. a lot of them, they yeah. know, chances are, most of the people they tell they've got cancer could still be with them in 10 years' time. Yeah. 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 And I mean, they'll know what they're like in 10 years' time. We're not going to improve the health and social care system no. through an opera. Oh, no. But, but, I know. Sorry, Cathy. You start. But, 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 but you know what 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 we do is we 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 illustrate some of the problems and we illustrate yeah. possibly some of the solutions yeah. and and one one you know it's a no-brainer solution really but it ain't going to happen is that um people when they're diagnosed should be retained within the memory clinic yeah you know yeah. because that's where the specialisms yeah. sit and that's where the knowledge of what yeah. people could be signposted sits yeah. but it doesn't happen you know well, and it's so, really tricky because people don't necessarily want to stay with the memory no. clinic at that point because of course in that first phase you could be really low and, yeah. ju and just want to to back away from everything yeah. oh yeah but i think it's, what i'm going to say with all yeah. of that is that if you if the lady can get into the head of 
she's an expert who usually would know what she's doing yeah and on this particular one it's it's like do I know and almost like yeah. I, I've, I've written down deep sign I'm thinking about when I used to go in when I started doing my teaching English as a foreign language and I had a new group and I didn't know who they were and I'd stand out to the room and here we go yeah and it's that whether it's something like that she could put in at the beginning when she's going to approach mm, go, yeah almost like the I'm stealing myself and so the abruptness is almost somehow conveying that she's nervous about it and, and it's less confident mm. and then in she goes and she's very authoritative like I used to do you know deep breath and obviously Keith's been teaching for his entire life but for me as an engineer going in and you know I'm to teach. okay here we go the beginning and and off I go and, and do this and I've got to stand there and yeah. betray myself you know and so I'm it feels for sure it feels like we've brought this beautifully back round to where we started which is that basically when people don't quite understand or feel comfortable with what's going on yeah it changes their behavior and yeah. it can make them really uncomfortable and so it feels like from a lot of what you've been saying it's about those changes and noticing them and then what noticing those changes does to how you feel and there's something really strong around uncertainty yeah. on and, for every different person involved and, and how that makes you feel a mask on so almost mm. if there's some way we could have her looking a little bit vulnerable put the mask on and then she's she's a professional that's in charge of that yeah appointment but before she makes contact with him if there's some way of showing that she's a bit vulnerable because it's like okay I've got to go and give this person and and whether that would, I don't know how Keith feels but whether that would show that she is a person but she's almost a little bit worried about this and that's why she's coming across so you're not cheating she, she, she might not have come across many people with young onset as well yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's, and because that's, that's, that's a, a different that needs, that needs to go yeah. into the into the yeah. scenario really yeah you know that Kaifa might be one of only a handful if even not even that number of people with young onset that the doctor has encountered yeah because there there are there are two extremes aren't there like for example in how the the gp yeah. de, how the gp deals with it you know the the horror end and the uh, the one that i'm more familiar with where the the doctor was actually playing a game with my partner <laughs> which i thought was a rather good way of dealing with it but it, so how, because, how did that work? Well, it was based, I think, on the idea that the doctor under, knew enough about the person to know how they were likely to react to a, to a diagnosis. OK. I have not got dementia. I have not got dementia. And so, uh, yes, uh, the doctor kept going on a softish sort of line saying, <clears throat> Well, just tell me a little bit more about what's happening, what you can do, what you can't do. And do you, do you think perhaps, well, you've got there are a few issues about your memory here. Would you like to go to the memory clinic? And, and after two or three visits around that sort of approach, eventually, um, you know, the word dementia came up. That's a really nice way to do it. And I love the it phrasing. It's very gentle, isn't it? Yeah. It's, I, I love, would you like to? Because I feel like so often in, in healthcare, it's just like you get you get referred and that is that has happened. <laughs> it's, 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 I mean, it, it, you, I, I come from the generation, of course, when doctors knew their communities inside out, GP sure. doctors, that is I'm talking about. So much more takes place in hospitals and uh, centres where of course the people that you meet you never probably ever meet again <laughs> True. Um, and it's a particular kind of personality approach I think that can cope with that on a regular basis I mean it's it's quite hard going isn't it definitely I am um, yes no I, I applaud anyone who works in the NHS especially at the moment I don't know how oh yes it. I agree with you No, I mean, I'm familiar with the concept of a care plan, uh, but uh, to be honest, it wasn't mentioned in, uh, in GP yeah. interactions, no. No, me neither. So yeah, my daughter has a care plan, 
you know, with her physical after her stroke. But I say for myself, no. And to be honest, at the moment, I don't think I need it. Mm -hmm. It may come to the stage that I would. So I think it'd be good to know that it was there and it was a potential that you could call on if you did need it. But no, it's never, ever been discussed. So but to do be you honest, have your... I've never asked it either. No. So do you, but do you have like annual review Oh, yes, yes. Oh, sorry, would that be part of the care plan? Well, no, I'm just wondering what, <laughs> like, this is, this is a sounds like a stupid question, but if there isn't a care plan, what what do they discuss at that oh, sorry. annual review? I, well, it's just really to see how you're doing. You know, sorry, I think if a care plan is cares coming in and, you know, having a social worker, having you know, that side of things, but maybe my perception of what a care plan actually is, is def is wrong, if you know what I mean. But it's it, not, not wrong at all, but I think sometimes people can have, you know, a, a document that it's more about you. So, you know, rather than it just being Catherine's on this medication and is it still going well or has she got side effects? It would be more like, um, you know, dancing is really important to Catherine. So, you know, is she managing to oh, keep up I with that? I have done something like that myself. You know, I have sort of put together stuff that if I was to ever end up sort of at the stage, you know, things that are important to me that, you know, I prefer tea over coffee. Uh, mm -hmm. I definitely don't want sugar sort of in my tea. Uh, you know, don't put sugar in anything like that. You know, so I in that side of things, I put things that, music I like to listen to yeah uh, things that sort of would calm me down um you know I like being outdoors I like sort of being around nature you know so I have done a document like that myself but it wouldn't be in any way official or mm -hmm. no medical or no professional has done it with, through it with me yeah yeah one suspects that hiding behind all this is an element to do with legalities, isn't it? Uh, so that things can be there for reference. Uh, but no, I, I mean, I, it, it, they're very, it's a very variable feast, I think. My, my partner was plugged into the memory services and there was a regular review. I think one of the memory service people came to the house uh, for a slightly more detailed a more yeah. informal um, um, interview, and uh, who, who knows what records they keep because mm. the, the amount of paper is frightening, of course, but it, there's not, as far as I'm aware, there's not much flow back to say, yes. oh, this is what we've got on your, on your record. And the sad thing for my particular partner was, of course, well, she was she was torn out of that in one county and taken away to another area altogether. And well, that completely blows it up then, doesn't it? Hasn't actually been plugged in there at all. Uh, she's she's gone into a different kind of pathway, mm -hmm. uh, but um, that's um, more to do more medical than uh, than social, I think. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It does seem to be such a a lottery of whether you happen to be with somebody who maybe knows about this or thinks it's important. Yes, I think that's true too. Which yeah. is really tricky. The GP should be the person who's um, the care coordinator on the care plan. Yeah. Um, but really what, what tends to happen is if the person has got a care plan, it's often not worth the paper it's written on. Mm. It's usually something around um, the medication that's been prescribed, the annual review, if it's going to take place, and the GP being available if and when required, if you can get hold of them. But on the care plan, it would say that the GP. And then yeah. on the other side of the document, it would have a crisis number. You know? So yeah. if in the case of a crisis, ring this number. Yeah, that would be the care plan. OK, if it's wow. in place and 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 it's it's appalling because there's nothing proactive in there to enable that person like accessing music therapy, accessing occupational therapy, yeah. accessing walking groups, accessing photography groups, 
accessing this, accessing that, accessing a, 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 a psychologist therapist, et cetera, et cetera. There's yeah. none of that. None wow. of that. There's no social prescribing, which should be really embedded in that care plan. Yeah. No, you're talking at less than 5% probably of the population that would get a care plan that has all that on it. And, you know, my care plan, you've, I think I've, you've probably seen it and I've certainly talked about it, is, is, is really good. And it's really good because it took four years to get and 10 minutes to write. You know, and the person who wrote it with me, I taught in primary school, you know, because he's my consultant. So I have he can write really well. I have yeah. some leverage over him. Yeah, well, yeah, he can't spell very well, but he can write well. <laughs> um, so, so who do we blame? Yeah, I know. So um, that, that's the situation you see. And Kaifa should be receiving a care plan, but almost certainly won't be. I think that's very, that's perfect. And I think that's something that sort of, you know, as you progress sort of through, you know, that people will say, you know, they'll never ever forget how somebody made them feel or being in a particular situation made them feel. Uh, whereas I say, you know, there's programs I'll watch, there's books that I'll read, and I know in that moment I enjoy it. But don't ask me 10 minutes later what that was all about but I know in that moment I have enjoyed it and to me that's the most that's all that's important you know I love going to theatre I absolutely adore going in, and I love the whole sort of atmosphere and the the build but don't anybody ask me to exactly what it was but I know it made me feel good yeah yeah. So therefore, it's somewhere I want to go again. Mm -hmm. An interesting counter in here, however, though, because, say, for example, if you listen to Jane, and she's so good at quoting the examples, it's those striking things and behaviour that people do remember. You may not remember them, it's what other people... Uh, yes, I pick up on, yeah. Some of, the, some of the parameters by which they measure it, you know, how things are changing, or at what point something... Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, mm. So that, I agree with you and the emotion, you know, the central bit is the emotion. <laughs> but I like that statement. I think for me, I couldn't have put that any better. You know, I've heard a lot of people say exactly that. And I think that's, for me personally, I think that's spot on. Well, that, that, that is a statement I've made many times. And also, I would also apply it to what James just said about reading. Because, you know, for some time I've struggled to remember what I read and I used to get beaten up, beat myself up about that. Yeah. And I came to the conclusion that wasn't very helpful. So what I now feel on reading is it doesn't matter if I can't remember what I've read or even if I can remember if I've got the book or not. Yeah. What matters is how that book made me feel. Mm, so if I enjoyed yeah. the book. And you can equate this to opera, you can equate it to a film, you can equate it to a TV series, because I've got no, I, I really terribly struggle to mm -hmm. watch television and to watch anything visual that requires me to engage with the storyline yeah. and to try and remember it. But what I do do is I see it as eye candy and I see it as something I'm enjoying. Yeah. I, I, if okay. I end up hour or hour and a half thinking oh I like that or that 20 minutes of reading or half an hour of reading I enjoyed those pages that mm -hmm. is all I want from that yeah it's completely different completely different from 12 years ago yeah, yeah. different person Kathy in that respect yeah and, and I mean that expands that very important point that Kaifa's making there or you know is going to be made in the opera there because yeah. it's not just what people it's not just people mm -hmm. yeah yeah everything engaging in life yeah. yeah it can be going on a trip to somewhere 
you know, an outing, and people might not even remember they went to that place, but yeah. the fact they enjoyed it or didn't enjoy it even, you know, it was a horrible experience. That yeah. will also stay with them. Or that film yeah. was awful, you know, or that book was, you know, very boring or whatever. Mm-hmm. That that also will stay with them. I, I simply portrayed the positive side to start with. But yeah. all those emotions apply. Um, so, again, I think it's really important within that um, final lines, if you can possibly get in there, people are the most important thing. But mm-hmm. it is more than that. I don't want people... Yeah. Just to think, the I don't want the people just in the audience just to think it applies to people because it does not. Mm-hmm. Mm. And it's it's really interesting hearing you say that because it going back to stereotypes, I think so many of us think, well, there's no point reading the book if you're not going to remember yeah. what the plot is. There's no point <clears> watching <throat> this if you're not going to. And but but from what you've just described you're still getting quite a lot from that experience. Yes. It's just perhaps not what you or the general public might expect yes. from the reading and it's experience. Exaggerated. It's exaggerated yeah. compared to the general public as well. Because yeah. everybody will come out of a film or everybody will end a book thinking, oh, I really enjoyed that or, or I didn't like that very much. That's, again, normal human behaviour. Yeah. With dementia, it's exaggerated. Yeah, no, this is making me think void. of... It's filling that void that that a person who hasn't got dementia would have, whereby they would engage with and remember the content. My mum loved Midsummer Murders. Absolutely. Oh she had a crush on John Nettles. She loved, and she loved anything detective. But I found that modern things, apart from Midsummer, to were twist. too much. So we got videos of Quincy because yeah. she quite liked him, Rockford Files, all of those really, you probably, Kathy has yeah. no idea what I'm talking about, but all these. I do. You know, I watched UK those. Gold when I was home from school ill. That makes and again, we watched, again, we watched Kathy, the originals. Relatively early into the pathway as well, this starts. Yeah. yeah. This doesn't start at the late stages of dementia. This starts early on because yeah. within, within months of being diagnosed at 54, I started an exercise book where if I watched a film, I used to write notes on it, test myself. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Because I, I couldn't remember what I was watching. So being the teacher, I did myself a, a comprehension <laughs> exercise. I soon stopped it. I stopped it probably after about six months because it was getting too difficult. But yeah. that was my way of coping and yeah. trying to sort of fill in those gaps in my brain that, mm. that that previously weren't gaps that would enable me to hold on to what I'd seen and heard. It's so funny because you're saying about that. I used to take notes about mum and then go off and, and, you know, things I'd noticed and then go off and see if I could find out what that was going. And mum used to refer to herself sometimes as, as Jane's guinea pig. Because, mm. and I remember I was, t- I was trying a thing of, because she'd get very tired and muddled in the afternoon. I wonder if you, if you lie down on the sofa and put your legs up so that you're getting more blood, would that help, I wonder? And then I was raising her feet up on a cushion and she said to one of the nurses, next time you, time you come round, I'll be lying with her feet up in the air and my foot, my head on the ground, up on the chair. And the nurse kind of looked at me and like, and I said, she's joking. <laughs> and mum said, but it, it might work. And I was like, no, we're not going to try that. But, but no, I was going to say about the, so she loved all the slow, like murder she wrote. We used to watch them quite mm-hmm. repetitively. And, it, and yeah. that eye candy, I've just written down, because that, that's so... <laughs> Such a good way of explaining because it is the old ones, the people that she used to quite fancy when she was younger, you know, like Rockford Files, you know, really almost familiar, gentle. To, uh, I mean, yeah. Quincy, yeah. compared to CSI, CSI they 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 do you know like five murders in one episode. Quincy will do one and and seduce about five women. Um, you know, very it's very very quite. If you watch it, it's really of its time. And I'd sit, I'd be bored out of my brains, but mum would really enjoy it because it was, it was the right pace. It was, yeah. um, but she loved Midsummer's Murders because she loved all the, the things. So then we would have a lovely conversation with a little bit of, bit of cake and some tea about the fact, isn't it good we don't live in Midsummer? And we've never, if we did live there, we'd never join a choir and we'd never go to that. Oh, you, would, never, you wouldn't do anything. You wouldn't do anything. No, you'd stay in your house locked in. Um, but we'd have this lovely long conversation about, isn't it good we're not at Midsummer? Okay, yeah. And then, then talk about other nice things and maybe look at some pictures of cats or something. But I was very aware of, yes, she, I'd, I'd get the call, your mum's up, and she'd say, and whatever it was that we'd seen on Midsummer, 
first couple of days, she would say that there, there was a man creeping around doing whatever this person had done. Or I'm a right. bit worried about the choir thing we went to earlier on. We never did choir. Okay. But, so, yeah. yes, it had to. So it's very much about taking the time to sort of reduce the emotional response to move away from it. Yeah. Okay. Move away yeah. from it. There's an interesting element in here as well, and that is for for carers to recognise what the things are that give you those pleasures. Yeah. And, and yeah. Not, well, that's very not, true as well. Not react to the thing which says, "Oh, well, you went there. You didn't say much about it. Probably you didn't enjoy it very much." You can judge from the responses, I can't hear yeah. the behavior, yeah. and the body language, it, and whatever that, that yeah. is worth doing again and again, and perhaps again yeah. until such times as it becomes impossible. Yes, yes exactly. Exactly. See you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah, bye.